Welcome everyone. In this video, we will talk about model management. When we talk about machine learning lifecycle, we refer to the multiple steps that are needed in order to build and maintain a machine learning model. This diagram was took from the Neptune.ai blog. I encourage you to take a look at this blog because it contains many interesting articles around MLOps. So here you can see that experiment tracking is just a subset of MLOps, but there is another area called model management, which covers experiment tracking and model versioning, model deployment, and also the scaling of the hardware. In the previous video, I show you that you can use MLflow to track your experiment. So we trained some models, we tuned their hyperparameters, we evaluated the model and then log some metrics, parameters, and all the information needed about the experiment to MLflow. Once we finish with this experiment tracking stage, it means that we are happy with the model. And then we start thinking about saving this model someplace and to have some kind of versioning. After that, we will like to deploy the model and then we maybe realize that the model needs to be updated in order to scale. Finally, once we deploy the model, the prediction monitoring stage starts. In this part, we will focus on the model management. I will show you how to manage your models using MLflow and how to deploy your models also from MLflow. Similarly to what we saw in the previous videos about experiment tracking and how to use Excel or any spreadsheet as a basic version of experiment tracking, we can use folder system as a very basic way of managing your model versions. In this case, we also identify a few problems. Commonly, these files or these directories are created manually and this process is error prone. So it is possible that accidentally you end up overriding an old model. Also, there is no clear versioning of your models. Sometimes the name of the folder will indicate the version of the model, but as soon as we start growing the number of models, we end up on a very confusing versioning system. Finally, there is no model lineage which means that it's not easy to understand how all these models were created, what were the hyperparameters used, what were the data, the training and validation or test data sets that were used to train and evaluate this model. Let's see how can we do model management with MLflow. This is the code that we used previously to train and save the linear regression model locally in this folder called models. So here we are passing the dick vectorizer and the linear regression model as a tuple and we are saving it with pickle. Later I'll show you how to log all the information about the training to MLflow including some tags. I was passing the training and validation datasets path to MLflow and also this is a code that we used previously to train the linear regression model. And as you remember, we also saved this model to a local folder using Pico. I also show you how to log some parameters and metrics to MLflow, but in this case we didn't save the model. So let's try to save the model using the most basic version, which is saving the model as an artifact. So for that, we need to call MLflow, and there is a method called logArtifact. This method takes as input the local path, which is the location of the artifact. In this case, it's models, and the name of the file is linregression.pin. And then you need to pass also an artifact path, which is the location in which MLflow will save your model. Let's run this code. Here we can find the new run. It was generated just second, seven seconds before. And as you can see, the parameters were logged, the metrics, the tags, but there is also a new folder in artifacts, which is called models pickle. Inside, you can find the file that was saved with pickle. Uh, if a data scientist wants to get access to this model, can just download the file from here. And if the data scientist knows how to run this model, will be able to maybe make some predictions, right? The thing is, it will be nice to have a better way to 
save your models in a way that can be easily run after that. So let me show you the second way of logging models with MMflow. So let's just start a new run. And I'm going to choose use the same code that we were using to train the, the HE boost with the hyperparameters that we found after the hyperparameter search. I'm going to log the parameters. You can also use MMflow log params and you just can pass the dictionary with all the params. And instead of logging each parameter one by one, you can call this method that is, you know, has an S here, it's like a plural, and then you just need to pass the dictionary with all the parameters. I'm logging the metric, and now let's log the model. For this, you need to call MLflow. The, then the framework that you are using to train the model, in this case, is actually boost, and then log model. This method will check the model as input and then again the artifact path. In this case, models, MLflow. So this is gonna take some time because we are running the model for 1000 iterations. Let's just wait. So we are back to the MLflow UI and let's check the run. So I haven't disabled the auto login so as you can see, a bunch of parameters and metrics were logged automatically. Furthermore, you can see that the model was logged twice because the first one is the auto login was uh, saved the model as an MLflow model. And then we also use the method log model and save the model to this other models underscore MLflow. So just ignore that. But let's take a look at this. If we save the model using this method, you can see that a bunch of files are saved here. The most important one is this file called mlmodel which is created by mlflow to store information about the model itself for example the artifact path indicates where the model lives and then there is a list of flavors that are available for this model by default all the models are available have this python function flavor included which means that your model can be loaded as a, just a python method the second flavor is XGBoost. so basically it means that you can also log this model as an XGBoost object you can see that the MLflow stores information about, for example, the Python version here or the XGBoost library version. And furthermore, there is this conda YAML file, which basically indicates the environment in which your model has to be run. For example, it includes the version of XGBoost, uh, learned, which was used in the notebook also, Pandas, MLflow. So in this case, scikit-learn is actually is not needed for this model, but MLflow tries to infer the dependencies from your conda environment. So it's assuming, uh, MLflow was assuming that this library was also needed. You can edit this and modify it. It also saves the version of Python, as you can see here. In case you don't use conda, you can also, also access the requirements txt file, which contains the same dependencies. But in this case, the Python version is not indicated so let me just try this one more time but i'm gonna disable the auto login just to avoid logging the model twice and i'm gonna add one step to also log the preprocessor because if you remember at the beginning we were using tick vectorizer to generate features out of the initial data set from the New York City taxi, it's a good idea to save it as part of the artifacts because in the future we want to make predictions with this model and we have the raw data, we will need to preprocess that data the same way that we did with the training set. And that's why it will be useful to save the preprocessor here. So let's go back to the code. We are back here to Visual Studio and I'm gonna disable the auto locking. So true. This means that MLflow is not going to track any parameters automatically. And so this is a code that we were modifying before. We are logging here the best parameters, the metric, and the model. I'm going to add another step here to log the preprocessor. So MLflow, in this case, is log artifact, right? I'm going to save it as a just as an artifact. The local path, let's say that I'm going to save it in models preprocessor.p and the artifact path uh, will be yes let's call preprocessor okay now i'm going to save the model the preprocessors with pico this is models this is a binary 
and now I'm going to use pico dump and the dictatorizer object was called db and now well out okay let's run this so we need to refresh this and yes we can see now there is only one model saved here the, the run has just finished only seven parameters were locked which are the parameters we passed to the lock balance method and only one metric and here you can see that now there is only one model being saved and also the preprocessor was saved here as an artifact so later we can load this preprocessor to preprocess the prediction data and then pass it through the xgboost model if you want to make predictions with the model then it becomes handy to take a look at this section because MLflow automatically generates these code snippets to make predictions. For example, the first example shows you how to make predictions on a Spark data frame, and the second example shows you how to make predictions on a Pandas data frame. So the two examples are very similar. The first thing you need to pass to the MLflow is the run ID, or actually the this is the model. URI, it is the unique resource identifier. MLflow uses this string to identify your model. And basically in this case, you are pointing to a run. This is the run ID. And inside this run, you are looking for this folder in the artifacts. And then you use this method, MLflow Python Spark UDF to uh, log your model as a Python function and use it in Spark to make predictions. The second example, as I mentioned, is very similar, but the difference is that here you use this method pyfunct.loadModel and this loads the model as a Python function that later can be used to make predictions with pandas. Let's copy this and check it. I'm going to paste the code here. Uh, we don't need to import the flow because we already did that. And I'm going to just remove this part. Okay, I'm running this and that's it. Because I connect, I'm connected to the MLflow, so the model was loaded. And this model, if you check it, you will find that it's an object of type MLflow Python dot load model. So this is basically a Python function. Instead of this, we can load the model as an XGBoost model because, as I mentioned before. MLflow saves these models and it makes it possible for you to load it in two different flavors. The first one is Python function, which is what we just did, but let's try to load it using the XGBoost flavor. For that, I need to call MLflow XGBoost load model, and then I need to pass the name of the model Yuri. The model Yuri, okay, I have it here, basically is this string. Execute this. And now XGBoost model is an object of type XGBoost core booster. So basically this is an XGBoost object. Now we can make predictions with this model. You can actually access the methods of this model. You can see here, for example, best scores, best entry limit, get score, uh, save model. So this is an XGBoost object. I'm going to make predictions. And for that, actually, we have the code uh, around here. Yes, so booster predict. I'm going to copy this. Instead of booster, we will call the object that we just called before. And after a few seconds, we have our predictions. Let's check the first, the top 10 predictions. Here we, we can see that the model was making the predictions and actually this should be, should match the same values that we got with the previous model with this booster. So let's do a quick recap of today's video. I just show you how to lock models with MLflow and we tried two different ways of saving the model. The first one is using this method log artifact that basically will consider your model as just another artifact from the run. And we also saw that this was not very useful. Instead, we tried to lock the model using this method called log model. And in that case, we also saw that MLflow was storing more information about the, this model that was being saved that later allowed us to load it very easily. So for example, if you have 
a model from any of these frameworks. Actually, this is not the complete list of frameworks that are supported by MLflow, but if you see all these frameworks on the left, they are supported by MLflow. So in all these cases, you can train a model with, for example, TensorFlow, and then you can call the method logmodel, and the model will be saved into the MLflow model format, which, as I showed you before, it is just a convention of files. Thanks to this way of saving the model, you can later access this model using different flavors. For example, you can read the model as a Python function or as a flavor like, in this case, a scikit-learn model if you were using scikit-learn to train the model. And this I show you that make it super easy to retrieve your model and make predictions on a new data. So you can later deploy this model as a Python function or in a Docker container or in Jupyter notebook or maybe as a batch shop in a Spark. Furthermore, you can load this model on a Kubernetes cluster or deploy it to different cloud environments like Amazon SageMaker or Microsoft Azure. In the next video, we will talk about the model registry, which is another important part of MLflow, which allows you to have an organized set of models or versions of models and to decide which models are ready to production, which models should be archived and so on.